Hello and welcome to the Beyond podcast and today I I have a very special guest. Uh, We are doing something a little bit different today in the sense that we're we're going to be talking about early modern plays in intersection with modern plays and modern playwriting and what we do. So my my wonderful guest, who are you and what is your purpose in life? (laughs) My name is Mark Ravenhill. Uh, My purpose in life is really to have as much fun as I possibly can, I think. And uh, one of one of the ways of uh, enjoying myself hugely is uh, I write plays. So I first had a play produced in 1996 and that's become my occupation, profession and uh, still doing it now. So you're you're here in part because you made the the fatal error of 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 putting on social media that you'd been reading some some uh, early modern uh, plays uh, of late and uh, was that coming about for a reason or were you just uh, just suddenly had the the, the end to read something uh, a bit older? I mean, I think my reading of early modern plays sort of comes and goes in 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 waves. So that so that wasn't the first time by any means that I've I've, I've come in contact with early modern plays. But yeah, I think, um, yeah, I was thinking about a new play that I'm writing. And I think to read early modern plays at the time in which you're thinking about your own play is a very sort of uh, liberating experience. Because I think the range of styles, genres, devices, perspectives on the action, the range from formal poetry to more sort of jazzy poetry to prose to to to, to the colloquial to to latin <laughs> the range of language is so broad it's just a huge great big rich grab bag of theatrical possibilities so i think over the years our range of colors in our dramatic palette has often got much narrower than that mm. so i think to open that up again and and reimagine all the all the different possibilities that are open to making something for the stage i think the most fertile most rich most chaotic in many ways period of th- writing for the theater is that early modern period so it's very inspiring yes we've been discussing actually uh, in what one of our sister uh podcasts uh, we've been looking at the the sort of evolution of verse and the the the, the play of language over because we cover such a large period of time we're going all the way mm. back to the medieval and uh, and that there, there really isn't a norm that there, there are because there are so many different venues so many different companies so many yeah. from uh, from all the way through to what we might call today amateurs through to professional writers um you have such a broad range of 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 directions of travel because uh, even then, there is a sense of well, if you're writing for f- four actors in a small room, you know the studio setup uh, is a very different job of work to writing an epic with sixteen plus actors on on a main stage in in a modern venue. So the the analogs are still there as well. Um, Absolutely, and yeah, and just on the level of 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 rhetoric, any play still today that's that's going to live and breathe within a sp- Within a bigger theatre, seven hundred, a thousand seats. If you if you're writing for the Littleton or the Olivier, you're going to have to use the art of of rhetoric because that is the language that carries in, into a bigger space. So whether you're consciously doing it or n- or not, once you move out of those one hundred seat black box theatres, or even you know, probably do without re- rhetoric within two or three hundred seats, but once you're in those big big bigger stages you're going to be tapping into the power, power of rhetoric because you've got to create words that travel across the stage to the other, to the other performer and out to, to, to a big audience. So you're going to be drawing on the arts of rhetoric, which obviously the vast majority of us are a lot less schooled in than an Elizabethan grammar school boy. But at some stage, I think in writing for those bigger spaces, you're going to consciously or unconsciously start to investigate and start to use the art of of rhetoric which you know for the first time in this country crosses from the schoolroom onto the public stage mm-hmm. in this period that we're talking about and on on top of that people tend to think of the the early modern stage as uh, as not being visual as being primarily about the words and and, and yeah. the uh, uh which which is a 
bit of a lie. I mean, the, 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 there are yeah. plenty. Of, there are plenty of uh, texts. But when you're working for a, a big stage, you also have to be thinking about the image, the the, sta the stage picture as well. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, and, yes, you're th you, you're thinking in terms of bodies in space, and also you're thinking about when you're also going to use uh, the power of spectacle, spectacular moments. Um, that that maybe a more visual and and you know again that there's just such a range of that within with within early early modern plays that um, sometimes you know look, looking at a scene the actual movement is more or less inscribed in the scene if you look for the clues in the text and follow them they're sort of coding or sometimes directly not even coding direct direct instructions even though there aren't stage directions. That, that creates sort of vivid, vivid stage movement. But obviously also the art of the dumb show, the art of the mask, the art mm. of the stage fights, and so on and so on. There is a whole range of visual and physical devices and ways of working that, that are in these plays. That again, I think it's you know, richer than has often been the case in more contemporary plays. Yes, it's interesting that often when people are restaging uh, early plays today, they will be effectively adding dumb shows into the action because the, every so often they'll need to explicate something that a modern audience may not fully understand or a bit of context. So you'll have a bit of physical theatre going on. And of course, it's, it's, it's an effect that would have been used in the past, but not necessarily in that yeah text. although although yes i think oddly now we've sometimes got a little bit too far down that route i think mm. we have an anxiety that we need to do something visual and physical before before the play starts mm. because the audience will find it difficult to under, un, understand the language mm. um and we do find it un, sometimes hard to understand that language but I, i'm not convinced that the contemporary the audience the contemporary to the plays at first wasn't just overwhelmed by two people rushing on and there mm. there are you know there's often huge amounts of backstory and in and in, uh, info dumps at, 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 at the beginning of these plays for an audience even even at the time but i think often part of the excitement of these plays is yeah some of them have prologues and stuff but sometimes just people rush on stage and they're in the action mm. and we're now quite wary of that so often directors will put in a minute or so of people jigging around and making shapes and doing things with like before they sort of trust the audience to engage with the play and that's become a little bit of a mannerism mm. so sometimes I'd argue a little bit in contemporary productions which I see less and less is just start the play just yeah. get them on and get them into action and as soon as the light's up use the first line that 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 the playwright wrote. So I, th I think sometimes we overuse the sort of contemporary dumb show, particularly at the beginning of an evening. Mm, yes. Uh, um, one of the things we've been testing out is before the show starts, have a pre-show where we the actors will be coming on and doing a selective bit of text, not nothing to do mm. with the actual production they're about to see, to just tune the ear in. I think there is a definite five-minute gap Oh yeah, that sometimes always. happens of of getting the audience to just get used to a few archaicisms. Um, yeah, because yeah. there aren't actually usually that many, but they do crop up a lot. It's usually... no, I think we all, we we all have that experience with plays of this period. You know, they start even a play maybe that you know quite well. They start and you think I can't understand a bloody word, and then weirdly, yeah, as you say, about five minutes in, your ear gets tuned. It's almost like tuning into the radio, and suddenly you can understand everything, even when they're using words that you don't know what they are. You know, once once you engage with the character, the action, the emotion of it all, it's weird. Then you're tuned in and language carries you, you know. And as I say, I think the idea that the audience at the time absolutely understood absolutely everything is probably erroneous because it's such a rag bag in there mm. of, of, pop, of popular vulgar tongue stuff that maybe some of the audience wouldn't have got. Sections in Latin, which maybe some of the audience wouldn't have got. Mm references to classical illusions that some people you know I'm, I'm not convinced this idea which was really the sort of mythology in England coming out of the second world war that in the Elizabethan Jacobean theatre all the classes met together in harmony and shared a shared a story together and there was mm. a sort of oneness about the whole experience it was very much like in the introduction to Penguin Shakespeare's at the time it sort of starts with this is what Mary Tudor England was like and and the sort of ideal for people coming out of the Second World War is what if we could have a theatre that was this harmonious and brought everybody together, a sort of shared sort of 
mm. high high Tory sort of idea of what the theatre was. And I'm not convinced that actually that that actually all these different references and different levels of language and stuff didn't actually in many ways heightened differences in the in yeah. the original audience as to who understood what and who was following what because we have different companies we have different audiences for different yeah. companies we have different performance contexts uh so boys company plays will, will use latin in what we might think of as an elitist fashion because mm, mm. often with a uh, a playhouse play you will have with an adult company you will have a bit of latin but then they might gloss it in english it, immediately yeah, yeah, afterwards yeah. in a in a, you know, a play by john lilly that probably doesn't happen anywhere near as much because they assume the audience is educated yeah or at least a reasonable percentage is i mean they then also have fart jokes and other things to keep i was going to say that's, that's part of the pleasure of the boys company stuff yeah. is kind of those passages in latin but then you go to a piece of complete filth. I mean, often filthier mm. than the adult companies. Oh, absolutely. It's one of the problems we're trying to do, do boys' <laughs> company plays with boys uh, yeah, or young, yeah. young people today is that they're a little too rude sometimes. Oh, yeah, yeah, really rude. Yeah, yeah. You've obviously encountered early modern plays throughout your life. Uh, any ones that sort of leap out as, as having grabbed you or, 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 or connected with you? on? Well, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, I have sort of, obviously not throughout my life, as I got to A level, early modern plays had crept into both the A level English syllabus and the A level theatre study syllabus, which was a brand new syllabus when I when I was studying it in the in the eighties. So obviously, school Shakespeare and even through A level and stuff, quite, quite a lot of Shakespeare. But we were studying uh, the Duchess of Malfi and the Revengers tragedy in the late eighties, and I think particularly that time, it, it often took a few decades for for syllabuses to catch up. So. I think that stuff that people have been putting in place earlier in the century, T.S. Eliot and stuff, refinding, particularly Jacobean tragedy, had sort of crept its way onto the stages and then was finally on the syllabuses. So that would have been the first time those those two plays that I would have encountered. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, particularly um, the Duchess of Malfi is just a really, really good play. I mean, that's that knocks a good ten Shakespeare plays out of the out of the park just in terms of its its brilliance as a as as a play, I mean, you, you know, kind of the lesser Shakespeare plays, and every, every time I've seen that subsequently, that's just a really, really fantastic play. Revenge Tragedy, interestingly, sort of comes and goes in terms of fashion, and uh, I haven't really seen that around so much anymore. So I would have done that, and then I went to Bristol University, mm. and the Bristol University was the first university drama department to set up after the war. I wasn't there when it was founded, but um, and it was very much going to be its basis was in theatre history and a laboratory space where academics who were interested in uh, different periods in history could stage old plays mm -hmm. it was one of its founding principles which was a bit you know becoming a bit broader when I arrived but it was still one of the main things in the department so and and the founder of the department Glyn Wickham was mm -hmm. a, a medievalist mm -hmm. so there was still quite a strong strand of medieval medievalism and putting on those plays so for my sins i was in a production of the castle of perseverance i can't remember who i played are they all i can't i can't really remember i remember were, I had were to... you good or bad basically well, i i i was in a boiler suit waving around a spanner and i think i was some sort of sin is there a are there, there, are, are there the, a... all all the seven deadly sins so it's basically it's a battle between the the virtues and the vices for the soul of mankind and it is a pitched yeah. battle Okay, that's why I was waving around a spanner then. Yeah, yeah. So I was in the I was in the Castle of Perseverance as something. Mm. I don't know who would wave around a spanner. I've, I've got a feeling I want to say sloth, but why would sloth be rushing around waving a spanner? Anyway, um, <laughs> and um, so and that would have been 1987 that that we mm. did that. So I think the way that it was conceived would by by the direction the designer probably was quite heavily influenced by the fact that the Bill Bryden company at mm. the National had um, staged the mystery cycle. And that was re-edited, reworked text by by Tony Harrison from the York mystery cycle, I guess. Uh, it was a bit of a pick and mix. Bit, bit, bit pick and mix, yeah. yeah. That's right. He did a sort of greatest hits of, I mean, beautifully arranged text mm. and by, by Tony Harrison. And Bill Bryden brought together actors from the north and 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 use their own accents but also located it within sort of contemporary 
slightly nostalgic looking back probably a bit to sort of 20th century working class culture of, of the town band and the union and the social club and mm. and that sort of culture that was sort of fast disappearing but somebody like Raymond Williams had written about warmly as as sort of disappearing working class culture mm. so taking it from its sort of guilds associations more into sort of trade union sort of associations and a lot of the um staging of the mysteries used objects that working class people would in those days or even pre to the 80s have used in their in their jobs so there were bits of industrial plant material trucks and and and, and just simple things that you know it seems but everybody had their miners helmet with the, with, with yeah. their lamp on and stuff like that so that was that was very very influential amazing productions that's still still available to watch i think mm. on because they were shot for channel four so ours was very much I think using using a lot of that language. That's I think why I was in a boiler suit waving a spanner. I, th th I have to say that that image immediately leapt to my mind of going. I I I, th I think I can. That's because that's pretty much how they did a lot of the deep. Yeah, the, the I devils, think I was the, I, certainly the, the the end of uh, a doomsday that was everyone was in boiler yeah, suits. I, think. I was giving my Barry Rotter as as sloth or whatever it was. Um, and then and actually at the time that we did those, I hadn't seen those productions, but um, Bill Bryden sort of built up the cycle over a number of years, mm. and then. There was a, a big run through of them and all all day in the Cottesloe, just at the point that I graduated. Mm. So with my little bit knowledge of medieval theatre, although obviously you didn't need to go see it at the National, but you know, I've got a little bit of working knowledge of it. I went to see that and it was an absolutely amazing experience. You you promenaded, there was enough room on the balcony for people who wanted to sit down, but the majority of the audience were promenading in the space they took the stalls out. So I saw it in the Cottesloe and just, it was really one of the most exciting things that, that that I've ever seen. I mean, that really grounded, earthy verse and the audacity from which it moves from intense drama and tragedy to comedy, mm. just that quick flip is, is really extraordinary. And obviously their use of the space in some way trying to find what a contemporary version of 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 the pageant wagon and traveling through a town and stuff and using all the levels of theater moving in amongst the audience a lot of music from folk band i loved it so much then it transferred across the river so i went back a few months later and saw so and did the whole day thing all over again and that yeah and that's got to be one of the sort of richest experiences i've, I've ever had in the theater and then obviously as i was so i'm arriving in london then at the, at the end of the 80s hmm. it's not so long after the the rsc had opened the, the Swan Theatre. And for the first time, many of the plays of the early modern stage are being, or sometimes, you know, performed for the first time since in, mm. in the UK on the Swan. And, and, and lots of them coming to the Barbican. And there was, some of them even came to a theatre called The Mermaid, which is now just used as a conference conference centre. And I think what was what was exciting about that was very much before, as reflected in my A-level studies, the concentration had been on on tragedy, because I guess mm. you know, still often regarded as a higher form or something. But actually, the, the the swan rediscoveries of the early hits were things like Fair Maid of the West and mm. stuff like that. Also embraced comedies and cross genre things and all, and all sorts of stuff. So so a lot of that was coming starting in Stratford, but but coming into London. So I think at that period there was a sense of and in fact, these were like new plays because some of them had not been seen on the stage since 1590, 1620 mm. or whatever. And here, here they were on the stage. So, so, so you know, they sat in that stage, at that point, they sort of sit somewhere between, yes, they are an old play, but in many ways, they're a new play as well because mm. they're, they're new to all of us. So I think that was a sort of happy historical accident that um, I was arriving in London just as there was that sort of, big sort of explosion really of of opening up of that repertoire and i remember one of the um i think one of the plays i i need to articulate why really but um i think one of the plays that um really struck with me that actually i, I read a bit earlier and then then was produced a little bit later by uh the rsc was the roman actor mm. now that's messenger i think isn't it, it is, or, yes. or maybe or maybe because sometimes these plays get reattributed. you come back you know, oh now it's attributed to somebody else we're used to seeing a theatre that is about the amazing power of theatre. Mm. And sometimes that can feel a bit sort of self, self-congratulatory. Look, we've gone to the theatre to, to be reminded how theatre can be wonderful and magical and 
and Masson just plays so deeply cynical, really. Yes. That, that, but it's awful position the actors are in, that they're, they're completely owned by, by the emperor, but are convinced still that drama has a sort of didactic purpose and that if they can put the right play in front of the right person, they can change things. And they try and try, I think, three times. And each time it sort of fails, fails worse. And that's just, you know, it's maybe a little bit self-obsessed to me to, to pick out one that's so focused on on theatre. But I love its, um, I love that sardonic, cruel sort of undermining of, of lots of the conventions of the play within the play thing. But mm. also, you know, genuinely, although it sort of loses some of its punch as it goes on, I think, but certainly the opening, very um, good about how how do you find your place as an as an acting company within the power structures of the state how can you align yourself and uh because the, the actors are also struggling with the marketplace as well as and and that the mm. audiences aren't turning up so they're that they're trapped between trying to please the ruler and, and and please the power on the throne and please the marketplace mm. and it's very clear-eyed about that and you know and obviously still those things have felt very keenly by anybody anybody who works in the theatre and it's got I mean that's part of the sort of uh, turnaround of it the joke of it it's got you know the fantastic speech in defense of the theatre uh, in the trial scene which is two or three scenes into the play uh, the leading actor of the company is taken to the court the senate I can't remember and has a wonderful speech that that defends all this didactic purpose of the of, of the theatre and uh, not so much in modern times but often over the years was remembered a lot more than the play and lifted out and given as actors benefit evenings in the 17th and 18th century mm. the speech from the roman actor in defense of the theater and of course once you put it back in the, the context of the whole play every the rest of the place gleefully sort of undermines everything pretty much that he said in that in that defense of the theater so um i found that play just fascinating and yeah and that, that was a little bit later but yeah that would probably even beginning of the noughties that yes. uh, there, there was a production of the swan that sean holmes directed and then came into the west end with anthony Sher mm. as nero which emperor is it it's a later uh, emperor it's definitely a later emperor. yeah domitian um, domitian i think it probably is let me let me let Cause, me check because he's got a wife called domitia i think yes uh yes domitian there we go that was a early modern nerd fest contest <laughs> name the emperor and messengers the roman actor mm. yes and they they came to london with it with uh the malcontent and city some... mad city madam maybe or something so, yes yeah, something else there was there yeah. were three yeah and they, yeah they, they, they did that in rotation yeah about 20 years ago um <laughs> and you know so i suppose we're at a moment now like so that was an exciting project, many of these plays being discovered for the first time. Mm. And then we've sort of stalled a bit because what happens when you go back to them a second time? Yeah. Um, and so so, 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 that, so then they've stopped being like, it, it's an old play, but it's a new play. So, you know, we're at a point where w what do we do with that? So, you know, an interesting thing that's just happened is The Fair Maid of the West, mm. which was a big uh, hit for the RSC um, in that, in that initial rush of plays and that Trevor Nunn directed with um and I think that came to the mermaid probably I can't remember mm. but um with image and stops and uh coming back to it now still on I think or just finished in, it's just finished yeah. in, in this one is you know Isabel MacArthur has gone back and reshaped that play and re reimagine that play in terms of the fact that you know it's a very in, in its very play, playful way but it it is about the, the beginnings of it's certainly very mercantilist play and it's about the beginnings of sort of you know colonialism and stuff oh, yes and, yes um, I mean, and it, it, it's 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 uh it's a very difficult play to stage yeah, as we yeah. so um, and you know and within uh, uh, originally in the eighties, it was staged much closer to as writ. So Isabel's gone back to investigate how can you reclaim the sort of rumpy quality of that play, but also the the incredible female protagonist, mm -hmm. the fair maid. But navigate new ways through the way the way that it depicts a sort of journey around the world, often with quite um, sort of cartoony stereotypes of of people from around the world. Mm -hmm. So you know, so so. That's one way forward of that sort of little case study of a play that was 
I think probably not staged for hundreds of years before the Trevor Norman, correct? I don't, I, I don't think so. I, I, yeah. A lot of plays, are, um, uh, except for the re relatively, that said, every so often you find a, a production that, that pops out of the blue. It's um, that yeah. you go, you know, uh, 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 what was the one that I, I came across the other day uh, where. Uh, a warning for fair women, which was uh, I, I was reading yeah. a book saying this, this this hasn't been staged till the twentieth century, um, and then I stumble across a melodrama uh, in the late nineteenth century that is 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 doing it, and I'm going, yeah, hang on, yeah, um, so, yeah, so maybe that's one one way forward, and um, so yeah, but you're right. I mean, there were it wasn't solely confined to that period in the RSC, so there was a previous generation. I mean, that that was the Swan came became a sort of more or less consistent production line for mm. sort of 10, 15, 20 years of early early modern plays and doesn't really do that so much now. But um there were other earlier things. I mean the the director Bill Gaskell was particularly fascinated by by Middleton. And he was an interesting figure because he was both very connected to the Royal Court, but also connected to the to the Royal Shakespeare Company. So he's directing new work at the Royal Court, but also at the at the RSC and a few other things, but his Bill's particular passion, I think, was for for Middleton, and he he loved the acute social eye of Middleton and the bitterness and yeah, I I think he felt that you know, the anti romanticism of of Middleton Bill was particularly attracted to. So actually, he does do things like at at the Royal Court, direct a Mad World, My Masters, and this stuff did then ripple out often to regional repertory companies which mm. were much better funded and more of them up until the 80s so when i was a student in bristol the local theater was the bristol old vic and i did actually see a production of the dutch courtesan actually think about it i think it was a production from the theater school that was in the theater and i don't think that was that unusual mm. to occasionally see theaters around the country claiming one of these early modern plays. The Dutch mm. Courtesan had already been produced at the National in the late 60s, I guess. I think so, yes. I the can't remember. The National has a, a, a quite a good yeah, so, approach. Yeah, and, you know, Tynan was, Kenneth Tynan, who was the literary manager of the National, was championing those plays. I mean, he was he was championing the Roman actor a, a, a long, long time ago, mm. and uh, nobody, nobody put it on. But the Dutch Courtesan had, had been, uh, I can't remember who directed that, had been at at the national, so that was probably why it was popping up at that time at at Bristol or Vic. That that anything that the national had put on under that Olivier regime, it instantly raised its profile hugely. I remember loving the the Dutch courtesan as a twenty twenty one year old. So, and I don't think we've had a chance to see that again. And mm -hmm. you know, that's and I, I'd love to see a Dutch a Dutch courtesan. I, I mean, I, I read, I, I've, I've almost it. directed it about two or three times, yeah, and it always yeah. quite slips through from my fingers slightly. Yeah, yeah, but I've read it recently, and um, yeah, the Dutch courtesan herself is a really fascinating figure. It becomes a sort of revenge revenge thing as well. But I think her, her she's a genuinely complex character. I found shifting my allegiances for and against her. She's the goody. She's a baddie. She's a uh, she's passive. She's active, um, and and obviously that very clear eyed thing of the city comedy of locating her within an economy and, and the economics of the situation. Mm. I, I, I think that's, that will be on my list of could I say production plays of the Dutch courtesan mm. would, be, would be a rather wonderful thing. The, the, one of the things about going through all of the plays and literally everything is is you know sometimes you come across a play you think why isn't this 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 out there and I, I, I came to interact with you because you tweeted about Thomas Woodstock um, which is a play uh, that lacks an ending, which is quite frustrating. Yeah, it was interesting because I read Richard II again and more than a lot of the other plays, I sort of thought, this seems to be relying on the audience knowing a lot as though something has happened before. You know, it seems mm. to be building on something. And I never really thought that about Richard II before, but looking at it, I just thought, I just got this feeling that I thought, did somebody write something that the a lot of the audience might be with, familiar with that sort of works as a prequel or first play or something? And so, yeah, then, uh, you know, I, I sort of I Googled that question or whatever I did, and I found out quite quickly there was Thomas Woodstock, which, you know, in some ways is the sort of set, set up for, obviously it's not intended thus to be, but I'm sure lots of the audience would have been familiar with when they and they brought that knowledge to coming to see Richard II. Mm. So yeah, I I I um read something or Thomas Woodstock sort of has does that. So yeah. 
I, I got it out of the library and, and had a read. And, uh, you know, and like so many plays of that period, it's it's very rich and full and it's got, you know, just all the dynamics of the, the and the breadth of the breadth of the portrait of society that it's that it's painting mm. is in some ways broader than the picture that, that Richard II paints of a whole mm. of a whole world, a whole society. I mean, it's I'm not saying it's a better play than Richard II, but I think it's got a broader it's got a broader canvas in many ways. And then um it doesn't quite have an ending, does it? I mean it's almost got an ending, but I think it's it, a few it's a few pages short. It, it's it? a couple of pages short of an ending. The, the 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 primary battle has happened, the we know which way the wind is blowing, the the uh, one the one set of major villains are dead. Uh, another set of uh, major villains are getting their come up, and so Tresillian, the the corrupt chief justice, is uh, has has basically been dobbed in it. So it's just about the question of how do you reconcile Richard with the lords? With the lords, um, yeah, yeah. And that's you... that's basically the the question of how to do that. Yeah, at the end. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, you could do it with just sort of good pastiche and sort of invisible mending or you or you could or you could make something of of that and and, and declare the fact there isn't ending and sort of make a more declared sort of interventionist stating it's a it's, it's a rewrite but you know i think there is a i think i think it would be beyond academic interest i think it'd be genuinely mm. a great afternoon and evening in the theater to see those two plays john of was got leading through to richard the second as as a as a, and i think it would yeah, I, I think it would throw new light on Richard II and create a fantastic line through of mm. a sort of history, history duo, history diptych or whatever you call it. I well, it does. It I think does that's got genuine potential to be actually, a, you know, speak to a, a theatre audience rather than just academic interest. Yes, I mean it's 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 got some lovely set pieces. It's got the worst wedding speech, uh, best man's wedding speech. Um, I, I think I, I've I've, yeah. I've stumbled across. Uh, uh, recently it's got a horse it's always got a, it uh, and the horse scene is lovely oh that um, horse scene's great it's one of the best horse scenes i remember that now now yeah. is this an is do we know who wrote it no we have absolutely no, no idea and it's really yeah. it's really weird because it's such it's such a solid play yeah it's very uh, it's, a, it's clearly not a sort of somebody having a go it's a very no. accomplished piece of theatre craft yeah and, and really there's i can't i can't figure out any fingerprints for it at all it, it usually you, you can sort of feel like scrooge mcduck through his his money yeah. piles you can sort of feel where uh it might be going but actually no genuinely can't it's got a later date um they, 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 they they've ah. learning so people it... have have put have have placed it at a much later date than than originally thought. Oh, okay, so so is it now possible even that it wasn't written before Richard II? Uh, yeah, that's the that's oh, the current thinking. Is okay. and they're fairly certain because of the the where the manuscript comes from and and how it came into being. Um, the redating seems quite firm. I I haven't ch double checked on that. Interesting. So my but, thesis is blown out of the water that the audience would have known well, that play before they came to Richard II. Well, no, yeah. it's it's not because that we know there are more Richard II plays. The the thing is, there's mm. a multiplicity of plays dealing on the same subject yeah, on the yeah. stage at the time. We just yeah. don't have them. I mean, there's another Richard II play, which is The Life and Death of Jack Straw, which yes. does with the Peasants' Revolt, which is a, it, as the other end of the scale. It's um, it's an incredibly short play. It reads like the film script adaptation of a play. Mm. Rather, yeah. it's, it's got all the plot beats and yeah. it's got some good stuff. But it's it's only an hour long. Um, yeah. And it does it does what a history play does, but it just does it in that role. So do you think that might have been a longer play that was then squeezed down for a sort of remix to be performed in a specific space or to tour or something? We don't know. I mean there's there's so many options. It's it's a really good play to discuss about the kinds of theatre that were existing in the 1590s yeah. because it might have been more designed for say in in spaces rather yeah. than the bigger playhouses um though size of inns varied. It might have been that it was just designed to be that size and it was part of a double or a triple or a quadruple bill of plays. Yeah. It could have been cut down. It could be a first draft that hasn't actually fully been fleshed out. Yeah. Um, it functions. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, mm. it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's a really nice scalable one actor, which is what I really like about it. Yeah. Um, oh, you, I'm sold. I'm sold. I'll, yeah. I'll read it. Yeah. But but it is it is odd. It's got a very good goose. It's got another a very good animal scene. Uh, it's got a scene with a goose, <laughs> <laughs> which is clearly a puppet goose. Um, puppet goose. It's clearly oh. a puppet goose. Um, uh, spoilers: the goose doesn't survive. Oh. 
Um, okay. So okay. No, you know, the, the, content no, warning ahead. No, uh, okay. There is... I'll I'll push it. I'll push ahead and read it, but I'll prepare myself for goose death. Yes, it's uh, it's live on stage. Uh, he's having. <gasps> The oh, clown no, 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 no. Is, the clown is having a conversation with the goose about yeah. cooking the goose, and then someone comes up behind, chops the body of the goose out from under it, and and runs off with the body of the goose, and and he's just left with a head, and with he's just head. going, and you know, and it's like, oh, it's Rod Hull all over again. Isn't it's it? Rod yeah. Hull all the way through, and it's yeah. um, we're very much looking forward to creating that goose prop because mm. there's mm. going to be a lot of fun to have with it, um, in a sort of sad, sad goose death way <laughs> <laughs> unless you make it a very annoying goose if you make it, if you if you play it more along the oval goose yeah much way then you're actually quite glad when it's dead yeah yeah um I, I i think it's probably trying to tell the clown that it's being having its head sawn yeah. off you know to, ah, yeah. and then yeah, yeah. Down, down it goes um so yeah i think so so to, so yeah to, i'm just sort of thinking about what we're talking about so yeah mm. i mean one of you know one of the ways is um Listen, I mean, we've always edited mm. and even tidied up, and often in rehearsal, slightly rewritten, rewritten these 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 plays. Mm. So it's not as though we are have ever really seen the hardcore real thing. We don't quite know quite what the real 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 thing is. Mm. So literary managers and actors and directors will often cut the plays if there's a word that's so obscure that it's going to block the audience. You know, you'll discreetly change the word. So that over the years, there's always been a lot of sort of undeclared, invisible, mm. mending work sort of going on in all these plays bef before an audience meet that meets them. So there's a sort of spectrum towards involving a writer and rewriting them. It's not a side either, either or situation. And um, yeah, as part of the Na that National Theatre project in the late sixties, the wider project of Olivier's National, Edward Bond was coming in and creating a version of of, of of, of the white devil which is essentially you know a sort of extension of what before a literary manager director and actor would have done in in being in sort of making the text work on the stage and and in, in that case you're declaring who the who the person is who's doing that because Edward bond was at that stage probably even you know a little bit of a draw as a as a, as a name and then you get things later which are sort of more de much more declared things and i you know i think there's mileage to be explored in this which hasn't followed through so because of bill gaskell's fascination uh with middleton mm. you get uh in the 80s the howard barker women beware women which was happening i read that when i was at university it was sort of happening when i was at university but but so i i just read it but you know that's that's a great idea first half take the play up as is or you know as as is once it's been edited a bit and blah 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 and then the second half go over to you how barker and how barker writes a new mm. second half for that for that play so you know sort of declaring that very openly and sort of creating a dialectic between the original play and and a contemporary playwright who in some ways was creating his own sort of language both language that you speak and wider sense of language of contemporary tragedy and that yes. you know i think i think that i think that was a big bold thing that nobody's quite explored things that, along that way where it's definitely a sort of big intervention and an argument in some ways with mm. with the play obviously what we tend to do now is uh, as we get more politically aware and more sensitive to issues is is we would tend to rewrite the plays to take out stuff that that we might find offensive and that's probably going to be a dominant thing but but there but there are other ways in which a writer might intervene and i think there's a little clue somehow in that bill gaskell thomas middleton howard barker piece i think there are all different ways in which contemporary writers can interact intervene argue with that body of work and it is often the second half of the play that is the problem um yeah it, yeah it, it i mean really i felt that very strongly with roman actor i thought actually mm. the second half it, it it sets up more than it delivers and and mm. i felt uh roman actor next time around would actually benefit yeah, so that's a different thing. Again, that's really just making it a better play than it actually is because it, it it doesn't quite 
fully explore all the arguments and stuff that it sets up and yeah. it feels like the second half was just written the night before in a bit of a rush there's something that the, we we call it the curse of the final session we usually read a play yeah. over about three three sessions and it's often the ending where you just it just doesn't land it just doesn't yeah. quite work or in the case of usually with comedies it just nose dives into the misogyny and you're just going right yeah this this isn't a this isn't a comedy ending mate uh, this is this is a tragedy, and yeah, and yeah. often with comedy, that's the big problem. The advantage was tragedy. If you don't like the people, they usually get horribly murdered, and all you need to do is add an additional stabbing. And you, if if there's someone who survives, you don't like. Um, yeah. With a comedy, the misogyny is often so baked in, yeah, that you have to kind of start from the ground up um, yeah. to actually make people laugh. Because that's if they're not laughing, it's not a comedy anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is the fundamental problem of you know I can present a, a tragedy where people stand on the stage and be sad, and and that functions perfectly well. Yeah. But if you need an audience response and the audience won't give it to you That's, if they yeah. presented the material yeah. as it stands, something that might have been made, you know, or, or arguably I think sometimes we patronise the past but mm. we say okay the audience at the time would have just found this a jolly comedy ending. Mm. It's very uncomfortable for us, so. Do we accept the fact that this this moves out of the area of comedy for us, and that's mm. great, and we have this unsettling, uncomfortable ending? As you know, mm. all sorts of decisions are made about the ending of something like Measure for Measure, or do we go, no, this the writer declares it's comedy; they want it to comedy, therefore dramaturgical rewriting work to mm. reclaim it for what we find funny. Mm. So I think there are different, yeah, there's all sorts of different approaches to take on there. But if it's declared above the title a or just below the title a comedy, mm. then yeah. What what you gonna do with that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have uh, we have nattered on for. God, a we've fair jabbered on for time. ages. We have. It's been very. This is. I was a bit worried that we were we were not gonna quite quite find uh, find the of the route through this, but this has been very productive. Um, I'm gonna plug my show now. Please do. So I am back. The bitch is back with the Royal Shakespeare Company. So uh, we we actually start previews in. February the 21st so so sort of a couple of weeks from when I'm talking to you now and then we're on six seven weeks in the swan that space that I talked about which was sort of built in the first place to reclaim a lot of the <laughs> early modern work so apologies uh, mine isn't a piece of early modern work so it's, it's it's a play about the composer Benjamin Britten and his work with the composer Imogen Hulse it's a two-hander two but it's about they they've got they're really up against it they've got nine months they've been commissioned to write this big opera for the coronation of the Queen, and it's the story of uh, Elizabeth and Essex, mm. an opera called Gloriana. And it's the first time he brought Imogen Hulse down to Aldborough to work with him. So the two very strong personalities with this ticking clock of we got nine months to get this huge coronation opera on stage. So yeah, if anybody is is in the Warwickshire area, you can come to the Swan before April the. First week in April, April the 4th, 7th, something like that. And uh, then hopefully some further life after that. But let's see. Mm, yes. Well, it's 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 uh, it's dealing with material from the, the, the early modern period of dealing with... There is a link. First, so there is a link. This, and, is, not, uh, this is not a forced forced link at all. No, and Imogen Hulse was a very uh, interesting in all sorts of things. Lots of early music. So she was doing a lot of research for the opera into into early early music and there's she brings some Dowland and stuff and they play that and then she was researching the dance of the period so she dances for Britain demonstrations of Elizabethan dance and stuff mm. that's all that's all in the play so yes if you are an early modern theatre nerd as you, chance you probably are if you listen to this mm. um, you do get Elizabethan music you do get Elizabethan dances sort of quoted and used and worked in the in the piece alongside a, a more contemporary story. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> links will be in the show description. And if oh, you're bless listening you. to this as it goes out, that should be uh, still on. If you're listening to it beyond the first quarter of 2024, it'll be on Broadway knows. by then. It'll be on Broadway by then. It'll be fine. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much uh, for thank all your you. time. Thank you. Yeah, we really um, nattered on, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. Thanks.